Okay. So, the word universe itself is something which is very interesting and which you have heard many a times um, in various places not only in physics it is a sculptures universe, a sportsman's universe, these have other cultural connotations, uh, but today we will discuss something about the physical universe which is does not pertain to any sculpture or a painter, but the things <coughs> which make up what we call the universe. Now, it is a very grandiose task, it is a means what are the things which constitute the universe first of all. That is first of all a very difficult question to ask, because means there are lots and lots of things which are there in the universe. As far as modern understanding goes, the basic ingredients of the thing which we call the universe is, def are means is definitely made up of something called stars, which you know. Our sun is a medium scale star and of course, if there are stars, there are planets around them and which we which is called the solar system, which we live in and then <coughs> these planets and these stars, there can be lots and lots of these stars, which make up something which is called a galaxy and then these galaxies can themselves, there be lots of these galaxies together they form what is called a cluster of galaxies and then there is clusters of galaxies may again join together to form something which is called a super cluster of galaxies and this kind of structures goes on. Now, as I said the simple word star, the simple word star does not mean uh, means it is not something simple, there are lots there are various kinds of stars actually. It is not a very simple thing that there is only one kind of star called the sun and it burns like this there are lots of variety of stars. Now, the most basic ingredient of a star is that it emits light and a planet does not emit its own light. The moon does not emit its own light, neither the earth. Now, what is the mechanism of producing the light inside stars? The mechanism to produce light inside stars is related to the fact that the stars which we think of now were <coughs> initially okay, before going to what makes the stars shine, people try to think that these stars shine because they are a bunch of material which is gravitationally attracting towards its center. And as things are gravitationally attracting towards as as the material of the star is mainly gravitationally attracted towards its center, what it ha what happens is that some of this gravitational energy of this object is converted into heat energy and that heat energy produces the light and heat which we see. That was thought in way back in 1860s, 1850s by people very important people like Helmholtz and others. Now, what happened, but if this is the way a star shines it came out that the sun should not be shining more than some 4 or 5 billion years, but the earth itself age was more than around was of the order of some 4 to 5 billion years. So, now if that is the thing, then it was very difficult how come the solar system existed for such a long time. So, then people understood that only gravitational energy transforming into heat energy is not the best way to produce uh, this light and other energy in the star. So, there must be something else which is going inside these stars. So, what are this what is this something else which is going inside this star that came into account. Now, mind it it was around 1860s to 1870s at around um, in the around 1900s there were some important experiments which were done in a different field which is called radioactivity and they were done by Marie Curie and her co-workers. They understood that there is something called beta decay, there is something which happens inside the nucleus and there was something called the nucleus of atoms and the atomic picture was taking shape and there was something called the nucleus of the atoms through the nucleus of the atoms certainly at certain times okay, very randomly. Uh, you expected electrons coming out. Now, how you could explain them? 
the explanation came that in a certain way some neutrons inside this uh, nucleus was transforming into a proton. Neutron was transforming into a proton plus a electron plus something like a neutrino, which is something like an anti neutrino, but we do not require to go into the details of that. So, a nucleus has neutrons, neutrons are converting into protons, the protons are sitting inside the nucleus again, but the electron is coming out. So, that electron and of course, the neutrino was also coming out, but way back in 1900s, people did not know that there was another neutrino there. The neutrino was actually discovered much, much later observationally, much later at around 1950s, 55 at around those times, it was observed, observed. but people thought at that time that a neutron converts into a proton and an electron, the electron comes out that is the beta decay and things like that. So, a nucleus in a nutshell is not something which is stable. So, this was the onset of some research which is called radioactivity or nuclear transmutations. When a nu neutron turns into a proton, the nucleus itself transforms into another nucleus. So, because the, the identity of a nucleus is by the number of protons it have. If it gains one more proton, then it becomes a nucleus of another element. So, there are ways in which things can transform and there are other ways which were discovered later way back means around 1920s, where you can take two lighter nucleus and they can interact to produce a heavier nucleus. Like if you take two hydrogen means nucleus, they can burn together or come together to produce a helium nucleus through certain processes. Those are called fusion processes. Okay. So, at around 1920s to 1930s, it was understood that actually inside the stars, what is happening is there are nuclear reactions. So, the stars are actually fueled by nuclear reactions. This may be a star and there are nuclear reactions there. And what is actually making the star stable is that as because this star is there, how did it form? It formed from some elements which were there in the universe somewhere and they were somehow coming towards a gravitational collapse. They were trying to collapse towards each other and come to the center. Mainly it was hydrogen and deuterium initially, which were coming in. This was purely due to gravitational collapse, but as these elements were coming in, their density increased near the center. <laughs> And due to other thermodynamic reasons, the temperature also increased and these objects which were near at the center lost their electrons, the atoms lost their electrons, became nucleus. And then what happens is that as more and more gravitational collapse becomes means takes place, these nucleus come towards each other and start to fuse. And when they start to fuse, they produce means heavier elements and a lot of energy. Fusion produces a lot of energy. Fusion is the same process by which human beings produce the hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb's essential understanding is a fusion process. So, in this fusion process, there is at a certain time when the density of the star increases at the center, at a certain juncture, the temperature and other parameters are ripe such, such that the fusion process starts and nuclear reactions starts at the center. As soon as the nuclear reaction starts at the center, it is more like a bomb. It is more like thousands of hydrogen bombs inside the star. And then what happens? These bombs try to expand or explode in a common language. Now, you know what happens when a bomb explodes? When a bomb explodes, it takes all the material around it away from it. It explodes. That is the meaning of explosion. But here it it cannot take all the material away from the center, because there is an implosion initially. It is imploding and then at a certain time, it starts to explode. This is a very interesting thing, because the nuclear reaction started inside. So, what happens at a certain time? There is a balance between these two. The imploding effect of the gravitational collapse and the exploding effect of 
lots of hydrogen bombs inside the starch center. And they, when they balance each other, this thing forms a stable entity and which we call a star. This is a very simplest understanding of star. Now, what happens is that there is a lot of light and energy produced at the center. This light and energy produced at the center, they actually diffuse, not only diffuse, they try to, try to means gets radiated. Radiation is very less, because there is lots of matter inside it. So, mainly it is convection and diffusion and this kind of energy tries to means go in various paths and reach the surface of the star. And once it reaches the surface of the star, this light and other energy comes out, which we see. Actually, this is a very interesting thing. The light which we see from the sun is not the light which is coming from the center of the sun. The light is coming from the surface of the sun. The center of the sun's light is not coming out. It is diffusing. It is coming towards the surface. And then once it leaves the surface, there is nothing to impede its motion. So, then we see that. So, that is the light and energy which we get from stars. And then what happens is this that <coughs> initially people now think that most of the stars burn hydrogen. There is a fusion process where hydrogen converts into helium via various nuclear reactions and then this helium then converts into carbon and oxygen and other elements which are more means heavier than hydrogen. These are fusion processes which produces more heavier elements. Now, fusion processes can go on till something where you find which is called the iron. Iron has the maximum binding energy. Then it is very difficult to go in this process, but there are other ways in which people have invented how the other higher means heavier elements can be produced. But the important thing is most of our modern understanding starts with hydrogen and maybe deuterium and helium and then the starts are some kind of machines which produce heavier elements from them. You do not require heavier elements to start with to produce this fusion process at the center. And the difference between starts and planets are that, that in planets this gravitational collapse never produced that amount of temperature at the center which produces nuclear reactions. So, planets do not produce their own light. They are just gravitationally collapsed objects like a piece of stone, but of course, with very interesting uh, kind of internal structure, which are really under study now. People are still understanding what is at the center of the earth and how the earth's magnetic field is being produced and things like that. These are under research, these are research material. But it is certainly right that the, the planets like earth Venus, Mars do not produce nuclear reactions at the center. And if they also produce, they are not such that they will produce nuclear fusion. There can be radioactive beta decay processes definitely, but there is not any nuclear fusion at the center. <coughs> now, why did we start with start with stars? Because stars are very much abundant in the universe. And the second reason is very important. We said that stars started with some very, you can understand the mechanism of stars by energy production, by assuming very light elements to start with. You do not require very heavy elements to start with, but then is it necessary? Why do we require light elements to start with? Now, that is the interesting part of the early universe understanding, because when we talk about an universe we have to answer various things, what are here and what we see and how they were produced. We see stars, galaxies, super clusters of galaxies and other things. Now, how were they produced? First of all, an answer can be they were never produced, they were always there and uh, you can have God Almighty sitting somewhere producing all the laws and all the things and things. So, and that is what it is. The universe is always there with a supernatural God, who is guiding all the understanding of how things happen. Now, the, it is not very bad an idea, but the interesting idea is, but more interesting things happens to be there, when you try to see that okay, for most of the things on the earth, like motion of objects, how things burn, how things fly, you do not require 
God to be explicitly present. And so you know the laws by which these things happen. God may be present or may be absent. We do not require his or her presence exactly. They may be in your mind. Now, the point is, can't this also be extended to other things? Means, how stars are formed? Here we said that we do not require exactly the hand of God. You can find out it by applying the principles of nuclear physics, the principles of gravitation, Newtonian gravitation initially to start with, and then you can figure out how the stars work and they do. So, then why do we, why will we suddenly take help of God at certain space? Can we do it without someone? So, the fun is you can, you can to a, to a great, great extent and if you do it, then the answers are completely different. Then the answers are what we call fall into the realm of science. You do not have supernatural laws, you have laws which you have discovered and then you extend it to various extremes, very early times, very distant means long means far, far distance away objects. Some in realms of this kind, you can apply your laws, granted your laws hold everywhere. That is something which we assume, that the physics which, which we understand in IIT Kanpur or in Kolkata holds in Andromeda galaxy and of course, in the far realms when the universe was formed. So, this is something which is a terrible truth which we have to assume to <coughs> move about. Now, as because that is the fact that if it was not omnipresent and if we do not require God exactly, then the answer which we and the various observations which we have about the things which are coming out from outside the earth and earth's atmosphere shows that there is a time history of development of the thing which we call the universe. Okay. The first thing which came to which was very serious uh, was in observed in 1927 by Edwin Hubble, and we who said that the universe is an expanding universe. Now, what do you mean by an expanding universe? So, initially we said that what are the constituents of the universe? The constituents of the universe are something like stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies and things like that. Now, the interesting thing is that all these things are at various length scales, means length scales means solar system scales which are astronomical units, but you move over to light years and then to mega parsec scales 10 to the 16 meters parsec scales which are 10 to the 16 meters and so on, which are huge distance scales. So, when you look at the scales of super clusters and clusters of galaxies and if you fix your telescopes at those length scales, what you see the universe is looks more like a frothy jelly, means everything is uniform there. You do not see some patches here, some patches there, some patches there. It is more like a means solution which looks uniform to you at this length scale. But then also something interesting happen, happens there. What Edwin Hubble noted is that these galaxies which are far away from each other are not static, they are moving away from each other. So, this is something which he observed in 1927, which is called the expanding universe paradigm. Means, he understood or took it in this form that the universe itself is expanding in the sense that things which are far away are moving away from each other and the rate at which they are moving away from each other is directly proportional to the distance between them. The farther they are away, the more they are moving away. The nearer they are, the less they are moving away. But next you can answer that are we moving away from each other? Not, certainly not. So, then is Hubble's law a right law to think about? Yeah, that is a very important thing that Hubble's law applies to cosmological distances, distance scales which are much, much higher, means in the scale of mega parsecs, means many, many light years away, means at huge length scales this Hubble's law is applicable, not in the terrestrial or solar system length scales. 
So, that is the point which we have to understand. At this length scale, Hubble's law does not appear, means it does not apply. <coughs> so, that was something which was the first thing which people understood about the universe. It was a very curious understanding. Then came nine, around 1965, two people they discovered something which is some extraordinary, something extraordinary, which they discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation c m in short c m b r the microwave you know you have many of you may have a microwave oven in your home it emits in a certain wavelength so that is called the microwave length and it is called a cosmic microwave background radiation because it was observed at around this time and interpreted later that in whichever direction you look from the earth you see that there is a radiation coming towards earth and this radiation is not unidirectional means it is not coming from a star because if it was coming from a star it will come from one direction or if it was coming from a galaxy cluster it will come from a patch in the sky but it was not coming from a patch in the sky it was coming from all directions in the sky and when you when they looked at it, they understood that this kind of radiation, this microwave radiation is more like a black body radiation. Now, you must have heard of black body radiation in physics. What is the black body radiation? It is the radiation, it is the kind of radiation which is produced when photons and material, other materials are in equilibrium with each other. So, matter and if matter and radiation are in equilibrium with each other, they produce a black body radiation. And this was a black body radiation which was coming black body radiation can have a particular temperature and the black body this black body radiation has a temperature of 2.7 degrees kelvin at the present time now how can we explain that means it is very interesting that you are getting a uh, means uni uniform radiation from the far far away parts of the universe which is reaching the earth's observatories at a certain temperature 2.7 degrees Kelvin and how do you explain that? It is very difficult to explain if you say that everything was as it was for ad infinitum in time. So, it cannot be done like that. So, what people have come up with an plausible answer is that actually long, long, long time ago means maybe we are talking about around billions and billions of years ago, 13 or 10, around 13 billion years ago, which is the approximate uh, lifetime of the universe, which we say, something happened and the universe, what we inhabit was completely filled up with radiation. It was a very catastrophic fiery ball and there was huge black body radiation at those times matter was in uh, means equilibrium with radiation and it was a very very cataclysmic event at that at those times it was not even series of events this universe was going through was completely bursting all the time in a certain sense now there is another hint this universe is also expanding now if there is a certain temperature and everything was there and it was expanding what happens is that the energy density gets reduced because the volume itself is expanding. Now, when the volume expands and the energy density reduces at a certain time various other things can happen. Now, what was the things what was uh, means bef before a certain time was that the universe was full of radiation and this radiation was not captured by other atoms or molecules. Why you only saw the light from the surface of a star and not from inside the star, because from inside the star the radiation was captured by molecules 
and atoms or other things inside the star and then again re-emitted. And in that way, they come to the surface of the star. But in the very early universe, the radiation was not actually accepted by atoms and molecules simply because there were no atoms and molecules at those times. Why there were no atoms and molecules at those times? Because you know, in the simplest hydrogen atom also, it has some kind of an energy above which means if you supply, the atom will break up. Means around 13 means electron volts, means that is the approximate energy of a hydrogen atom. If you give it more, the hydrogen atom will break up. Now, how do you give a hydrogen atom energy? You can shine light on it, put photons whose energy is more than 13.6 or around those an energy level and then the hydrogen atom will break up. There will be one proton and one electron and they will move away. So, now if the energy density of the universe was so high that it was more than the binding energy of the nucleus and the atoms, then you do not have nucleus or atoms in the universe at very early times. It is not only atoms, the nucleus were also not formed at those times. Okay. <coughs> As because there were no nucleus and no atoms at those times, so there were only photons and charged objects, because if you strip these things, you only ob find most of them are charged objects. And charged objects do have interaction with light in a much, much fiercer way than neutral objects because neutral objects can only interact with light by other means indirect means like dipole moments and other things, but charged objects can directly interact with light with their own charge. So, at those times in the very early universe, it was all charged objects and light which were interacting with each other and it was producing a soup of plasma, very hot plasma which is called the means the plasma of the early universe. But then, as because this universe was expanding, the temperature and the energy density was decreasing as time was going on. So, what happens roughly was at a certain time, the energy density came nearly towards the binding energy of the hydrogen atom or something like that. And when that object, that energy scale was produced, it was not produced in one second. There was a lot of interesting physics which was going on, because these are actually distributions of energy and energy distributions do not peak at only one point, they have a finite energy distribution. But anyway, roughly when the means energy density of the universe was nearly about the hydrogen atoms formation, you can and it went below, you can produce then hydrogen atoms, because there were less amount of photons which were more energetic than that, because the energy density of the universe came below the binding energy of the hydrogen atoms. And as soon hydrogen atoms were formed, they could absorb some light from the this primeval plasma. And as soon as this hydrogen atoms started to form, this primeval plasma got started to ab be absorbed. Okay. So, the interesting history is that there was a certain time before, where there was a completely fiery episode and then at a certain time in the universe, this fiery episode does not end, but there are hydrogen atoms which are formed, they try to absorb this light which is coming out. And so, the atmosphere transforms from charged objects and light to light and uncharged objects. Okay. When you have light and uncharged objects, this light can now flow throughout. Just like when light comes to the surface of the star, it flows throughout, because there are no charged objects outside. So, similarly, when you look at the very early universe, it is fiery, but then at a certain juncture, this fire got extinguished or was means it is not fiery now, because hydrogen atoms started to form and this light is coming towards us from that time. Okay. So, we are seeing the light from the early universe and that is the light which we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay. This radiation is coming approximately around 400,000 years after the onset of the universe according to the un modern understandings. Around 400,000 years to 300,000 years, it was a period where light was not being absorbed by hydrogen atoms and things like that. 
and it was completely fiery. And after that, this light is still pouring out towards us, but the universe is not full of this catastrophic radiation, because now we have a lot of other neutral objects and light is moving out without radiation means ionizing them in that way. But there were reionizations, but which we will not talk in this one hour lecture now. So, that is something which we know about cosmic microwave background radiation. And so, this is an expanding universe and we had a very fiery beginning that is something which we know. And then comes the another point <coughs> which we with which we started the things about stars. abundance of elements. Here elements means hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, oxygen the same thing which you find in the periodic table. Now, various people all chemists and geologists try to find out the amount of isotopes of various things in rocks and things like that, but cosmologists and physicists try to find out what is the amount of hydrogen, helium in the universe. Now, how do you understand about hydrogen and helium in the universe? The thing is hydrogen and helium they are molecules and they have absorption spectrum and emission spectra. And when you look with telescopes you can find out from the emission and absorption spectra how much amount of hydrogen or helium is there in near your surroundings. You estimate them indirectly you can back calculate them. From that it is understood that maximum part of the universe is hydrogen and helium and the heavier elements are there. I do not write the exact composition, but the point is maximum of the universe is still in the form of hydrogen and helium and deuterium and things like that which are very light. Light element abundance is very high. Now, how to explain that? Now, this again comes to our <coughs> various assumptions and things which we said that in the very early universe nucleus were also not formed. Okay. The deuterium nucleus requires at least one proton and one neutron to be there but that is also not formed because it has a binding energy of around 2.2 MeV around 2 MeV and if you have photons more than 2 MeV then they will immediately break. So, people have to take care of was the universe initial means if the universe was always full of deuteron the present understanding is not. Of course, there was a time when protons themselves were formed by the way because I have not talked about sub nuclear objects. Now, protons are not fundamental objects as they are there is a theory called quantum chromodynamics Q C D which says that protons are also made up of things like quarks and gluons. Now, around 100 and 150 MeV if your energy scale is more than that then it is very difficult to have bound state protons and nucleons they will break down into in quarks and gluons. So, in the very early universe it was not protons there were no protons first of all it is understood that it is there were quarks and leptons which are like electrons and neutrinos something like that. And then at a certain juncture means this protons were formed a proton is a hydrogen nucleus anyway and there are electrons, but hydrogen atom cannot be formed because the energy scale was much more than that 13 electron volt scale. Deuteron nucleus was not formed at those times and so the simplest thing which could have been formed in the earliest universe is from this protons and a neutron or deuteron. So, in the earliest universe things which we are now understand came through in this form that it there were protons and then there were binding energy curves and things which went on and the initially you produce deuterons and these deuterons produced the next important thing which are called helium. So, 
there were hydrogens deuted on hydrogen nucleus deuted on nucleus and helium nucleus initially to start with. So, these are the maximally abundant elements in the universe as because they were produced at the very earliest phase of the universe, they were the things which we find here today. Now, why not you produce other elements like uh, iron and things like that in the earliest universe. Now, the calculations about big bang and the nucleosynthesis this regime shows that you cannot go much above these very light elements. These light elements are the only things which are possible at very early phases of the universe. The heavier elements could not be formed. Now, then immediately comes the question then how, how, how does these heavier elements like carbon oxygen, nitrogen, when were they formed? Now, the answer to them comes that they were not formed in the very earliest phases of the universe. They were formed after the stars were formed maybe, because the initial hydrogen, helium and the deuteron, they were produced and they were important to produce the stars. And the stars were burning and producing fusion and then they produced the heavier elements. And then also the other thing remains how elements above Irons, iron were produced, that is also ongoing process which we are trying to understand. So, this all of this shows that lighter element abundance, the cosmic microwave background radiation and then of course, the expanding universe, all of them shows that what we think about today may not be completely very wrong or may be not very much away from the ballpark that maybe it was it is actually an expanding universe, but the thing is expanding universe is an interesting thing. Things are expanding in time as as time goes on things are moving away. So, what is happening if you think about back in time things were coming in. So, at the, at the very very earliest phase of the universe the size of the universe which we call which we live in was very very small was ex exactly ve means was very very small and if we think that what we know about or what we conjecture the size of the universe with in which we live now may have been subatomic in you know very very early phases of the universe so there the laws which guided the laws of the universe were not macroscopic laws but microscopic laws of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Of course, in the background of classical general relativity means relativity also got maybe not as it is now in the very earliest phase which is called the Planck time, but we are talking about somewhat more than Planck time. At those times gravity can be taken to be classical near about classical but all the other things are more like quantum. So, now that is one of the most fascinating things of modern way of understanding where we live and what we understand, what we think about. So, when we look at the night sky and when we look at the day sky also, the sky we see various bigger objects like sun, stars, things like that. Again, we, we must say that if our understanding is right about theoretical perceptions, then when the universe was in the very earliest phase, you did not have galaxies or stars, because when you go back, go back in time, things are moving towards each other. When the size of the universe reduces, then how can you fit in galaxies there? You can also understand it in other way, that as we said, that as you go back the energy density increases, at, at above a certain energy density you do not find atoms and molecules. So, there is not any matter to produce galaxies or itself atoms or molecules. There were only elementary particles at a certain means regime of the universe time at a certain time. So, after a certain time these galaxies and the other super clusters of galaxies started to form. This was means more or less around 400 thousand years after the big bang. The present age of the universe is around 13 to 14 billion years okay. and the time on which time around which stars and things matters actually started to form 
was of the order of 300 to 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So, this starts and these elements started to form and then once they formed, they produced the heavier elements which we use. <coughs> By the way, life has a very interesting relationship with this thing means somebody may ask why do we require that thing, but we require these things very interestingly because we ourselves are made up of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and things like that. We are not only made up of hydrogen and deuterium. So, we were we should have been uh, means impossible means any living beings if you do not there was no production of DNA, RNA which produce this kind of molecules and these molecules require heavier elements to be there and these heavier elements require stars to be there and therefore, we direct if our voyage about this scientific inquiry is right and which we think we are to a very great extent, we are not exactly, we do not know all the answers definitely, but we are also not so much wrong now. We definitely think that stars have a very important role for living beings and people like us and you because most of the material with which we are made up of were actually made up in stars. You, know, you must be knowing that stars die, means they end up in cataclysmic events called supernovas most of the time and many a times they do not, but then they shed a lot of materials from outside. Where does these elements go? They go again and they again regroup to produce planets like earth, Mars, Jupiter and things like that, which contains these heavier elements carbon, phosphate and nitrogen and things like that, which may be in a quick of fate or some accidental event produce self copying elements called ribonucleic acids and then it produces lots of interesting stuff and the laws of evolution starts and then life itself starts and maybe we are not the only one, because if our theory uh, uh, one's understanding about things have any scientific objective, then these are not accidental processes, they must be produced in most of the other places also. If actually they are accidental, then it is very unscientific to think about, when science is not made up of accidents, there must be rules why accidents are there. So, that is the reason we now search a lot of life on the other parts of the universe, because as because we exist, as because these laws of nature we know about, we think we know about, we must, we are also we, we, are, we also think that the same processes may have been worked out in other places and we try to contact the other generations and other intelligent beings if they are and try to find out the means what is the matter about the universe, but we have not still come across any positive signs. We are trying to find out planets and planetary systems which are very important. Okay. But coming back what we were saying that it must be understood that lots of things on this earth depends upon stars and if there were no stars, most of the things which we see today were not, could not have been formed because heavier elements could not have been formed. So, the stars were formed, they broke up, they regrouped, gravitational collapse took place and planetary systems were born, life was there and things like that, but now they were not everywhere all the time. Before 3000 to 4000, 400000 years, there were only elementary particles mostly and these elementary particles, if you go back more and more at about 3 minutes after the big bang, then you will find that it is all elementary particles and the laws of quantum mechanics are there. So, there are lots of interesting theories now, which are called the theory of inflation, which says that may be at around very small time after the means around the Planck time, there was a region, there was a time when there were lots of quantum fluctuations which went out, which were there, which shaped up what we see today. So, actually if the theory of inflation has to be taken correctly, then all the galaxies and super clusters and things which we see this kind of signatures were produced in the very earliest phase of the universe, when things were in a quantum phase. So, quantum mechanical principles may have affected the 
present structure of the universe. That is one of the most revolutionary ideas, which comes up from theoretical physics. People are completely now, people are always experimenting things, especially the cosmic microwave background radiation and trying to find out the maximal uh, information they can gain about inflation and about the earliest phase of the universe, because inflation happened into the earliest phase of the universe. And then from that comparing the structures, which we see today, how much can we understand about these quantum fluctuations, whether inflation was there and then there are lots of other things, which went on. Before I end, I just say that, what was the story of when it all began? It all began in 1915, around 1917, when Albert Einstein tried to find out an equation, which governs the most of cosmology, which is the equations of general theory of relativity, where he tried to find out that, what is the nature of the universe. And he firmly believed that the universe is a static entity. It is in balance and everything are there as they should be. And he produced a equation, the Einstein equation and the matter, which was there, the equations required some matter. He produced, he put some matter, which has 0 pressure and only energy density. This kind of matter, according to cosmologists are called dust, is called dust. But his universe was actually means not stable with that. So, what he did was, he produced some other elements inside his, introduced other elements inside his equation, such that it resisted collapse. That is called the cosmological constant. And with his cosmological constant and dust, he could produce a stable universe with a certain size and radius at around 1915-16 at those times. Then he said that he solved the means existence problem, why the cosmos exists. But then everything changed in 1927, when Edwin Hubble said that actually the universe is not made up of constituents, which are static, they are all moving away from each other. And then Albert Einstein understood that there is something gravely wrong in his theory. Means he, his understanding of the nature, of nature was that everything was static in the universe, but everything was not static in the universe, that was observationally seen. So, then the theory had to be changed and the theory became, and what Einstein introduced was called the cosmological constant at 19, around 1915 to 17 at those times, which, which gave some kind of a anti-gravitational effect, means the matter was trying to pull things inward, the cosmological constant was trying to repel this attraction and there was a static universe. In 1927, Albert Einstein rejected the theory of uh, implementation of the cosmological constant and there were other theories, by which the expanding nature of the universe was taken care of. Now, the fun is that in 1990s and 1998, something happened, some observations happened, which again opened up a new uh, gate in cosmology. They showed that, it shows that, this new observations show that supernovas and st means essentially exploding stars are moving away from each other or maybe from the earth at a rate, which is more than what we expected, if the universe is only made up of matter with 0 pressure. This is called dust, which we think today's universe is or is made up of. It is not with radiation. It is made up of some matter, which has 0 pressure. But these supernovas are expanding away at a rate, which cannot be means explained, if you think that the universe is made up of matter with 0 pressure. And then it was understood that this cosmological constant has to be introduced such that you can explain the way in which these objects were moving out. So, in 1990s and 1998, especially 2000s, people again reintroduced the concept of the cosmological constant, which Einstein discarded in 1927. And now, what we think is that we are living in a universe, which is dominated by the cosmological constant. Now, what is called domination? 
Now, the simple way of understanding the universe's history is like that. At the Big Bang, the universe, after the Big Bang, the universe was dominated. The most important energy density came from objects which were like photons, which, which were highly energy. Photons means which has zero mass. Now, when can you have objects which have zero mass? You can have photons, but you can also approximately find an electron to be like photon if you means approximate the electron's mass to be 0. When can you approximate the electron's mass to be 0? When the kinetic energy of the electron is much, much higher than its rest mass energy. Now, when can it happen? When the electron is extremely energetic. The electron's rest mass is 0.5 MeV, if you go back and see. And if its kinetic energy is much, much greater than 0.5 MeV, you can neglect the mass of the electron and then the electron starts to move means look more like a photon because you have neglected its mass it will have the same kind of dispersion relation as a photon and when most of these particles their masses can be neglected that means when they are extremely energetic all of them acts like a bunch of photons acts like they are not because if you reduce the energy an electron will become an electron a photon will become a photon but at extremely high energies electrons photons and quarks they their energy density more or less is the same. So, at the very earliest phase of the universe, all of these things were in the highest energy state and that was called the radiation dominated phase. So, what we now try to see is that there was something called a phase called big bang about which we do not know much. It is a singular state, but then there is something called a radiation domination. Okay. So, at that phase of the universe, it was completely filled with material whose mass could be neglected and the temperature was very high, but the universe was expanding and so the energy density was decreasing. So, you cannot have a radiation dominated universe all the time, because you know that what I said below a certain energy scale an electron will be an electron and a photon will be a photon, because photon is intrinsically massless but electron is not intrinsically massless. It can only be assumed to be massless when its kinetic energy is very high. So, after a long, long time what happens is that around 300 thousand to 400 thousand years this became a matter dominated universe. Now, what in the radiation dominated universe, this was filled up with a fluid, where the pressure of the fluid is made up of one third of the energy density. This is the same pressure, you know radiation has pressure, because <coughs> you must have read that comets have tails and the reason this comets have tails is because the sun's radiation pressurizes the comets and they have these tails behind them. If you do not go back and read that radiation do have pressure. So, this is the same pressure radiation pressure P is equal to one third rho and the material is extremely relativistic at those scales. At around 300,000 to 400,000 years near about the formation of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the universe becomes transformed into matter dominated state, where the equation of state of the fluid, which is the dominant fluid in the universe has p equal to 0, the energy density reduces. It is a non relativistic kind of theory, where the there is energy density, but the pressure which arises from the motion of the objects can be approximately be 0 or pressure is much, much smaller than the energy density. That is the thing which people say that it is a matter dominated era. So, the universe was not always in the same way as it is, there was transformations and much later it has come to something which is called the constant dominated universe. Where the equation of state is p is equal to minus rho of the order of where is a very peculiar thing, it is a negative pressure and that is the thing which gives you an expanding nature. Uh, 
Now, this is an esoteric fact. I am not going to explain it because you can learn them if you are interested more and more. But these are the various equations of state which happens. The universe has been broadly broken down into radiation domination, matter domination. Matter domination is the phase where maximum of the structures were formed like galaxies, clusters of galaxies, super clusters of galaxies. And now, we have moved into something which is called the cosmological constant dominated phase or dark energy dominated phase, what is also called the dark energy. So, these are broadly the phases or broadly the way we try to understand the various phases of the universe. Now, with extremely successful theories of physics like the standard model, which we have, we can chalk down most of the things which happens inside stars to produce energy and fusion and fusion reactions. But I will end with one interesting thing, which is very important nowadays, which is the most relevant thing in research also that it may happen that what we know our most serious and interesting things about particle physics and elementary particles is a very small part of what reality is, because there are various now we are sure we do not know a lot of things which we see. Now, what are those kind of things? The best example is something like the rotation curves of galaxies. Now, if you see that galaxies which, which are made up of stars there is a galactic center and there are stars moving around them. And these stars, how do they move? They move by Newton's laws, if you apply them. If the curvature is small, you apply Newton's laws. And Newton's laws give that, if this is capital M, this is small m and this is r, then m v squared by r is equivalent to g capital M small m by r squared. That is the centripetal force, which gives you the gravitational or the gravitational force, which gives the centripetal force. And you cancel this m and you cancel 1 r and essentially your v goes as 1 by square root of r with other constants. So, as starts, if the most mass of the galaxy is centered at this region about its center, as you move away, you expect the velocity of the stars to be falling. As r increases, this velocity must be falling. That is the called the Keplerian fall, which happens for the solar system. But the very interesting thing, which has been seen and reported throughout and is, is a thoroughly understood, means verified thing now, is that they do not fall observationally. Means instead of this velocities and radius means you start and you fall somewhere, it does not fall like that. So, somehow many a times remain as static. Now, this cannot be explained by Newton's laws. Means if you assume that most of the matter is centered here, you will be very difficult to explain it. So, the next important thing which people try to do is that may be the matter is not centered here. There is a lot of matter which is everywhere. Then what happens? The same Newton's laws gives you a different thing. Here this capital M has to be replaced by the amount of mass inside this cell. That is the theory of gravity, Newtonian gravity which gives. And then this law will change. And depending upon the density of the material inside that, you will have, you may have, you may turn out to be having a velocity, which does not fall. But then the point is, what is the matter, which is always there? We do not see it. We see most of the matter in the galaxy to be at the center. And then the other things are stars, which are dispersed far away. But for this kind of a dispersion relation, you require a lot of matter to be uniformly distributed throughout and we do not see that matter. We do not see that matter, but that matter is there, because it is gravitating. If Newton's law is correct, which we think mostly it is, and our observations are correct, 
there is a lot of matter which is there, but we do not see it means they are not producing photons. So, that is the reason which we call that this kind of matter which is producing this gravitational or uh, this kind of velocity rotation curves to be dark matter. So, this is something different, this is dark matter. So, this is something which pervades the universe and sadly we do not see it, we feel it gravitationally. When we said that we went into a matter dominated phase of the universe, tacitly now cosmologists mean that they went into a phase where most of the matter was in this dark matter phase, because this is the matter which is maximally produced or maximally there in the galaxies. The things which we are made up of are called baryonic matter or the matter which is there in the standard model of particle physics, but that interestingly is comes only 5 percent of the total matter content which we think about. The 25 percent of the energy content of the universe is in dark matter and the rest very interestingly the energy content of the universe is in the form of dark energy. Okay. So, the kind of things which we know about, which we do experiments about, which we can wow about is only 5 percent of the matter which we whose laws we know. 25 percent of the matter definitely do gravitate, but what they are made up of we do not know and the rest is again have a peculiar uh, equation of state p is equal to minus rho, it acts like something anti gravity, it produces a expansion of the universe and one minute I just explain and it produces an expansion of the universe and we are still in search of it. So, it was it is a great great thing that we started to understand what makes up our universe, what what's what what are the building blocks of the universe, how things were made, what were the main signals on which we our standard model of the cosmology is built. But sadly, or not sadly, but challengingly, we end with a lots of new problems. What is the nature of dark energy, what is the nature of dark matter? And I think uh, cracking any of them will be the next most important voyage of human understanding of the universe. Okay, thank you. Now you can ask.